Hi, this is Steve from ACCAAPC.com. So, what we're going to do today is where we're going to look at the substantive procedures onto the bank balances as well as the cash on hand. So, the bank balances as well as the cash on hand is particularly important for the business because this is the liquid asset for the company. So, uh, a lot of circumstances in the real life, of course, they, I mean, the bank balances as well as the cash may be stolen by somebody else. So we have to make sure that the bank balances within the company's account actually shows what the company actually has. So that would be very, very important. So when performing this substantive testing approach for the bank uh, as well as the cash on hand, so we're going to focus upon the C CSR. Um, focusing on the cash on the right hand side, mainly what we're going to do is when we're going to count it. Because in lots of circumstances in the real life, the company wouldn't have too much cash on hand. So they would like to bank those cash yeah, to the bank, so into their bank accounts, rather than having them on hand. Because cash is easily stolen by someone else, okay? So that's why from the auditor's perspective when trying to check the cash within the company we're going to count it so that's the uh, idea behind it but the question is you know when trying to perform the substantive procedures onto the bank balances what sort of things that we're going to check then of course we're going to check the cash account within the company we are going to obtain the bank confirmation letter We're going to check the bank statements. Uh, also, we would like to do your favorite thing, which is the bank reconciliation. That's what I mean by C CSR. Okay, so those are the things that we're going to focus upon when we are auditing the bank. So, before we move any further, of course, I'd like to Firstly, focus upon the bank reconciliation and then we're going to focus upon how we're going to prepare the bank reconciliation and then we're going to be from the auditor's perspective how we're going to check the bank reconciliation and we're going to check all of these items within the bank reconciliation later on and we're going to detail back the bank confirmation letter when we come to it. And after look at the left hand side, we're going to look at how we're going to audit the cash on the right hand side as well. So, let's look at the bank reconciliation first. Like, this is the knowledge that you've learned in your earlier study. So, bank reconciliation actually talks about that the balances within the cash account, within the company, is not equal to the balances given by the bank statement. Because the company uh, would try to deposit this money into the bank. So that's why the bank statement actually shows how much money that the company has. The company wouldn't take lots of money on hand because those money can be easily stolen by someone else. So, for example, the cash account shows you you've got $10, but the bank statement shows, shows to you that there will be $15. So this is the differences between the two of these five and why is differences between the two of five then there might be three reasons for that the first reason being there will be unrecorded differences so what does this actually mean says for example the bank statement actually charges you the administration fee for the accounts maybe annually or monthly for example, it's to be $3. So the bank statement actually shows the cash out to $3 from the, bank uh, from the bank account automatically. But this has not been updated immediately into a cash account. So that the bank statement has shown a cash out of 3 but the cash account hasn't updated of this 3 so that there will be a difference between these two. The second reason being the time difference. So, for example, 
there would be the outstanding checks, the outstanding lodgements. What does this actually mean is from a company's perspective, so we received the money from the customer, so we debit the cash in our account, but we haven't gone through the bank to clear up this particular cash amount, which means that we haven't taken this money from the bank. And hence, of course, the bank statement hasn't been updated. So there will be a difference between the cash account and the bank statement. And the second thing would be the unprecedented checks. So what does this actually mean says the company agrees to pay the supplier and write out the check to the supplier and hence of course from a company's perspective we credit the cash paid. But the supplier hasn't gone to the bank to obtain this money from the bank and hence of course the bank statement hasn't been updated. So that's the time differences. And the third difference would be errors. Okay. So if we make an error, so the diff there's a difference between these two. Of course, we're going to look at the example later on when we come to it. But the question for you is that is the bank reconciliation a perfect way to try to audit, to try to make sure that the cash balance, that the bank balance is, is correct? Well, the answer for that is no. The bank reconciliation is not perfect. The reason behind it. Is because of this too. So the first reason that the bank reconciliation statement is not perfect is because if the company hasn't billed the customer, which means the company hasn't sent an invoice to the customer, of course this can't be shown in the bank reconciliation because the cash book hasn't updated it. Of course, the bank statements, we haven't paid the money to the customer. So, of course, this situation, the bank reconciliation can't show this because on both sides, we haven't recorded this transaction yet. The second reason being, of course, when there's an embezzlement. So what does this actually mean, say? When the customer pays you money and the cash share, may take the money into their own pocket away rather than record this transaction into the cash book. So from that perspective then of course embezzlement which means the staff within the organisation would take this money from the customer when the customer pays for you into his own pocket and hence of course both sides within the cash account as well as the bank statement wouldn't sh wouldn't show this particular transaction, and hence, of course, there will be a you know the cash accounts will equal to the bank statement. This means that uh, this particular transaction hasn't been detected by the bank reconciliation. So that's why the bank reconciliation is not perfect. So before we move any further, let's take it back from your notes and let's look at this question. It's called reckon. So we're going to look at this question of how we prepare the bank statements and we're going to describe the substantive procedures that the auditor will perform onto the complete bank balances. So 10 marks for it, so we're going to write 10 points related to part 2. So let's first focus upon the part A, is how we're going to prepare the bank reconciliation statements. So let me just to open up a new page for this, so this question. It's called Reckon. So, of course, the way we're going to do it is we're going to show the catch balances within the catch book onto the left hand side. And then we're going to show the bank statement onto the right hand side. So, we're going to show the bank statement balance. Are we going to plus the outstanding lodgement and minus the unprecedented checks? Okay, on the right hand side. So let's see what are, how we're going to do with this then. So let's look at the bank reconciliation here. So we are given 
the catch spoke which is the catch balances into the general ledger or in the main ledger if you like so we've got the balances to be 2911 and then we are also given the Hang Seng Bank statement as well so we've got the credit balances which means that the company uh, that you've got money into the bank this means that the company owes, to, owes money to you so that's why it's the credit balance for the bank so this means that we've got the positive cash within the bank is to be 4,626 so 4,626 so let's do with the first one, which is the uh, the notes that is given by your examiner. So we're given this up firstly, the company has made an error. So it's that for the check 2127. So the company's record is to be 1476 rather than 1976. This means that in you know the company should have recorded 1976. But the company only recorded it as to be 1476. So the company has to record another 500. So we're going to adjust for the error. In this case, we're going to plot that. It's to be 1976 minus 1476. That will become 500. Also, we are toasting a question that will be unrecorded bank service charge, which means the bank has charged you money into the bank statement, but this hasn't been updated into the cash book. So we're going to record that as well of 35 as the service charged. Minus the bank service charge. It's to be 35. We're going to total this down. That will become three thousand three hundred seventy-six, okay, or in dollars. So that's the adjusted cash balances, okay, on the left hand side. But how are we going to adjust for the bank statements on the right hand side then? So let's look at it. So. Within the cash book, so we've got the opening balance is to be 3285, that will be good. And we've got the check of 250, of 2124. So we're going to check them back into the uh, Hang Seng Bank statement here. Which is the 2124. Well, in this particular circumstance, this 2124 cannot be traced back to the Hang Seng Bank. This means that the company has received a check from its customer but hasn't gone to the bank to clear it. So that would be a difference between the cash book and the bank statement. So we're going to add this back for this check. 2124 as the outstanding argument of 250. Also, we can see that 2127 as well. So, the check. So, let's look at the check. So, on 4th October, the check is to be 2127. It's 1476. And we are told in the question that we make an error to record this transaction into the cash book. But according to the bank statement, as you can see, the receipt is actually to be. 1976. So we have dealt with that into the catch book already. On the right hand side, as you can see, it's the catch out from the company. So the first check is referring to as 2025 is to be 1000. So we're going to chase them back to the uh, bank statements so that we cannot find it. So that will be the unpresented checks. So this means that the company has written off the check to pay with the supplier. The supplier hasn't gone to the bank to obtain this money. So we're going to minus the unpresented check. So this is the check number one is to be 20, 20, uh, 20, 
25. Let's do 100. I also check 21, 26 of 500. We can't chase them back into the bank statement this well. So we're going to say that 21, 26 is to be 500. And for the remaining balances of 14, 41, and 14, 42, of 215, 315, of course we can chase them back to the bank statement as well. No problem for that whatsoever. So that, of course, we're going to total this down. That would give us 3,376. So as you can see, that's how we prepare. So as you can see, that's how we prepare the bank of reconciliation statement. And we can see that by reconciling the items, of course, it can give us the correct catch amount of these two figures. But the next question for that is, is the figures actually correct or not? So we have to question that particular circumstance. For example, if the bank statements here of 4,626 is not correct in the first place, of course, the figures will not be correct in the first place as well. So from that perspective, from the auditor's perspective, how are we going to verify this particular balance is correct? So that's, this is the part A, so let's turn to part B, so how are we going to do that? So, firstly, we are going to perform the general procedures. Firstly, We're going to agree all of these balances on the bank confirmation letter to accompany this bank reconciliation. to ensure the completeness of the bank balances. So here's the two questions. Firstly, what do we mean by agree? So agree means we're going to see whether or not the balances within the confirmation letter is actually to be the same figure within the reconciliation statement. So that's what I mean by agree. The second question being, what do I mean by bank confirmation letter and also completeness? So, what do I mean by bank confirmation letter? This is the letter sent by the auditor to the bank. So, from the auditor's perspective, we send the letter to the bank and ask the bank to confirm the balances of the company's account. So the bank will say to you, well, fine, so you asked me to do something for you, I'm going to charge you a fee, yeah, charge the auditor's fee, and then I'm going to send you a letter telling you how much balances the company has within its bank account. Any of these overdraft facilities, loans, guarantees will be presented into this letter as well. That would be no problem for that whatsoever. But next question is, how are we going to ensure the completeness of the bank balances? Well, the, 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 the idea behind it is that I talked to you before, that we've got the financial statements here, and we've got the supporting documentation here. So, so from the financial statements to the documentation is where we're going to test the existence of this particular transaction. And from the documentation to the financial statements is where we're going to test the completeness okay, of the transactions. As you can see, that we're going to be from the bank confirmation letter to the bank reconciliation, which is the balance will automatically be shown in the child balance of the company. So that's why from document to financial statements, we're going to test its completeness of the bank balances. So the idea behind it is that within the bank confirmation letter, it has presented you a lot of these transactions already. So you're going to see whether or not those transactions has been reflected into the reconciliation statements that you prepared. Okay, so we're going to try to see whether or not they're complete, whether or not all of these transactions has been included into the reconciliation statement. Okay, so that's the first procedure. 
the sick mods that we can get is that we can agree all of these balances in the bank confirmation letter to a company's child balance. to ensure that bank balances is complete. So, what does that actually mean? Is, as you can see, it's the same logic behind, uh, uh, as before. We are going to obtain the bank confirmation letter asking the bank to confirm the money that the company has in this bank and then we're going to see whether or not that particular figure is the same as the financial statements figure as well. We're trying to see whether or not all of these transactions into the bank confirmation letter has been included into the bank financial statement. So that will uh, verify its completeness. The third procedure being, we are going to agree the bank balances in the company's child balance to the balances listed onto the bank confirmation letter. To ensure the existence of the bank balances. So what does that actually mean is if you look back to the diagram before, we are going to test from the financial statements down to documents to ensure its existence. So for example, in the company's financial statements, we presented the transaction number one. So you said that you received the money of $100. So we're going to chase them back to the bank confirmation letter to see whether or not you actually receive $100 from, from others. If this is not the case, of course, your transaction may be fictitious and needs to be adjusted. So, also what we're going to do is where we're going to inspect the company's bank reconciliation and check the additions to ensure its accuracy. So what do I mean by that is if, if, if you're going to look back to the bank reconciliation in the first place in the part A, so we're going to say all of these transactions were not is correct. So that's what I mean by we're going to verify its accuracy. And also, if the control risk of that particular client's company is extremely high, surely we'd like to reperform the confirmation the reconciliation ourselves. So we're going to reperform. The bank reconciliation. To ensure its accuracy. Okay. So there you have it. So those are the general procedures that you have to bear in mind. And then what we're going to do next is that we're going to look at starting from the left hand side, which is the catch book. So for the catch book, for example, we have deducted the bank service charge. So you said that you deducted the bank service charge. So I'm going to do, I'm going to check whether or not the bank service charge is supported by some of the documentation. Now the bank may say to you, I'm going to charge you $35 per month, so written to the contract. So we have to chase them to the contract to see whether or not this is the case. So all we need to do is that, for example, we're going to chase the bank charges to supporting documentation 
to ensure it's his sisters. Okay. Also, ens ensure its accuracy as well. You can uh, point it out as the next sentence to gain you out the mark. Also, if you're going to look back to the bank statement on the right hand side. So, so you've got the outstanding lodgement as well as the unpresented checks. But the question is, how are we going to audit this thing? So, first, like, we are going to agree. All of these outstanding lodgements to the pre event catch book and post the event bank statements. to ensure its cutoff is correct. So why this is the case is because what do I mean by outstanding lodgement is that the company has received the check from the customer but hasn't gone to the bank to try to get this money. So from this perspective then surely if I received the money before the year event, surely this has been posted into the pre-year event catch book. And we are going to see whether or not so after the year event, so normally what the company is going to do is to prepare the bank reconciliation monthly. And what we're going to do is that we're going to take the bank statement after the year event to try to see whether or not we have gone to the bank to clear up this particular particular money. Because in most of the jurisdictions nowadays, of course, uh, the period for the for the for the check to be available is quite short. In some of the in some of the jurisdictions that will be ten days. In some of the jurisdictions that will be one month, etc., etc. So that of course it might be very very quick for the company to receive this check and go to the bank and take this money away. And if this takes quite a long time. For the company to take its money from the bank. So it may suggest the fact that this particular outstanding lodgement is not belonging to pre year event, but rather maybe the company, I say maybe, maybe, the, maybe from an auditor's perspective, we cannot see any transactions pre year event, catch book. And also the company has taken quite a long time to clear up this particular money from the bank as well. So maybe suggest the fact that the company has received this money after the year event. And from that perspective then, the money cannot be recorded into the pre-year event financial statement. Cannot be recorded in this year's financial statements at all. So that's why we are going to do this. Because a lot of companies, what they're going to do is try to window just the financial statements. And the way they're going to do that is that although I received the money after the year event, but I'm going to record in the current year's financial statement. The reason behind it is that I'm going to boost up the current ratio by boosting up the current asset. That's one way they're going to do that. Okay. So let's focus upon the unpresented checks on the other hand. So the second procedure being, we're going to agree all of these unpresented checks To the pre year event catch book and post the event bank statements. To ensure The cutoff is correct. This is the same as before. The logic is the same. So what the company does is that they like to. They have the incentive 
trying to reduce the liability, which is the payable. What they're going to do is that I owe to supply money, but in order to decrease the payable, what I'm going to do is to write off a check to the supplier, maybe after the event, but I'm going to take that before the event as well, as the window dressing issue. So we can't, from the auditor's perspective, we cannot chase, maybe we cannot chase back any of these transactions within the catch book before the year ends. Okay? Of course, this particular expense shouldn't belong to the, to the current year's financial statements as well. But what the company does is that the company uh, is going to pay off the supplier using a check after the year ends. And then maybe it takes quite a long time for the supplier to set to this particular money, to get this money from the bank. And from this perspective then, surely this particular transaction cannot be shown as the decrease in payable. Because if they're going to do this, the unprecedented checks, what they're going to do is to decrease the payable by debiting the payable and credit the bank. But from an auditor's perspective, because this is clearly a window dressing issue and so if it takes too long for the supplier to get this money from the bank, it takes too long and hence of course uh, they cannot be shown as decreased in payable so they have to be adjusted back. So here comes to the next of our points is that we're going to inspect any owed and presented checks to ensure if they need to be written back into the purchase ledger. So the reason why this is the case is because if we go to look back to the question before, as you can see, that the payments that is done by the company, this particular transaction is on 10th May. And we, you know, the company's all of these other transactions will be October. But this transaction is too old. In most of the jurisdictions, uh, there will be maybe 10 days, for example, uh, that the check is available. But here, it seems to me that is five months ago maybe this particular check is not available right now. So from this perspective then, of course, the company has debit the payable and credit the cash paid. But maybe the company should have write this back by debiting expense and credit the payable in the first place. Because this particular check may not be available. A supplier cannot use these checks to take its money from the bank. So this is what I mean. Okay, so any of these old unprecedented checks, which is the check that hasn't been uh, used by the supplier to take his money from the bank, of course, maybe we're going to think about, we're going to uh, write it down as the payable rather than credit the cash paid. And surely, we can perform the analytical procedures by reviewing the catch book and the bank statements for any unusual transactions. Or any of these large transfers. So this normally happens around the year end. To ensure there's no window dressing issue.
So normally what the companies does is that around the year event, they like to have some of the large transactions, large catch out or catch in, in order to make sure that the company's liquidity position of the company is looks better. So that's the window dressing because from an auditor's perspective, we have to make sure that the financial statements are providing a true and fair view. True means we're going to comply with the accounting standards. Fair means that there will be no window dressing issues exist uh, for the financial statements. So, so that's why we're going to perform the analytical procedure by trying to consider any transaction that is normal or abnormal and whether or not there will be any of this window dressing issue that might exist and if there's any, surely you have to correct this back. Okay, so that's the uh, you know procedures onto the uh, bank reconciliation, the bank statements, uh, as well as the cash book. So the next question for that is because I told you before that uh, we also got the bank confirmation letter. So when looking at the bank confirmation letter, so let me just write it here. There are particularly three aspects we like to talk about. The first aspect being, what are the contents within the bank confirmation letter? So the contents will include things like the balances of all of his account within a company. Uh, also, maybe there will be any loans that are spoiled by the company, and maybe there will be any overdrafts within the company as well. So what do I mean by overdraft is that the company hasn't deposited money into the bank but uses money from the bank. So the bank will charge the company an interest as well. Maybe there will be any of these guarantees might exist. Okay, so th those are the contents within the bank confirmation letter. So bank confirmation letter actually means that the auditor send the letter to the bank, asking the bank to confirm something. So there will be two approaches that the bank confirmation letter will be laid out. The first approach, which means is the direct listing. Second approach is the request approach. So what this actually means is, if you're going to take it back from the notes, so, we can use the first way by sending a letter to the bank and then we, from an auditor's perspective, we list the company, the bank balance is to be 50 and 100 and asking the bank to confirm whether or not this is yes or no. Okay, so it's done by the bank. The second approach that we can take is that we can send the letter to the bank directly asking them what is the balance in the bank? And then you have to give me an answer. What is the overdraft facility of the bank uh, of, of the company? You have to give me an answer as well. Okay, say to the bank. So those are the two approaches that we can, you know, uh, include into the bank confirmation letter. The third matter that we're going to talk about is the procedures involved. Because not every person on the planet can send this letter to the bank and asking the bank to directly disclose the confidential information of the client's company to you. This is not possible. And hence, of course, very, very importantly, you need to get the authority of the client's company. So I'm going to use a mnemonic called ARTS, A-R-T-S, to try to help you to memorize some of the key knowledge within there. So firstly, there should be the written authority. So, you need to get the written authority from the client's company that the client's company permits you, as the auditor, to get the balances from the bank. And second R is the reference. This means that when asking the bank 
to trying to uh, disclose the client's company's money to you, you have to say to a bank, you have to refer to the written, uh, written authorization that you've got from the client's company originally, okay? So from the audit, auditor's perspective. So auditor goes to the bank and asking the bank to disclose the bank balances of the client's company. So you have to say to the bank, so I've got the written authority from the client's company before you can do that. Third one is that you need to uh, bear in mind the time limit as well. So, of course, we are doing the audit and then we are going to ask the bank to try to disclose something to us. We have to make sure that this particular request is reached to the bank normally at least one month before the event, okay? To make sure that the bank has enough time to process this particular issue. So, the final S is what I mean by specifically check. So what does that actually mean says? From the auditor's perspective, we have to make sure that the bank statements, uh, sorry, the bank confirmation letter, the bank balances within there is absolutely correct. If we have made a mistake and the clients may sue our company, of course the clients may win and hope, and of course the auditor will have to pay out the penalty as a result of it. So we have to make sure all of these contents within the bank statements, uh, within the bank confirmation letter is absolutely correct. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to make sure that this bank confirmation letter is sent by the auditor directly to the bank. There's no third party involved to reduce the chances of manipulation. Okay, so that's the bank confirmation letter. Okay, so we finish off the left hand side if we're going to audit the bank. So let's look at the right hand side. It's where we're going to look at how we're going to audit the cash on hand by the company. And what the company now they does actually, or almost in the real life, is they're going to use the impress system. So let's take you back from the notes. As you can see, we use the impress system to uh, to determine how much cash we need to uh, have on hand. So we record this into the petty cash book. So for example, we decide the floating amount of this 100, and then we receive this 100, uh, you know, taken from the bank balances, yeah, from the company. So this 100 will be the cash on hand. So maybe we're going to use this 100 to pay off the STEM expenses. So that will leave us 90 of the bank, uh, of the cash balances on hand. And because our floating amount is 100, out of it pay off 10, so we've got 90. But we have to make sure that the, bank, uh, that the cash balances will stay at 100. So that we're going to make up another 10, so that will become 100 here. Okay, so that, that's the impress system. But the question is, how are we going to audit the cash balances? So let me start a new page for this. So, when auditing the cash balances, firstly, from an auditor's perspective, we can count the cash balances at the year end and agree to the petty cash book. So normally, if I'm if I'm using the impress system, for example, one hundred in this case. So let's look at the how we're going to audit the cash balances on hand. Of course, for most of organisations, they would like to use the impress system. They determine the floating amount the company should have the cash on hand. So, for example, in this case, it's to be one hundred, and the company spends ten cash out to the expense so that the company is left with the cash balances of 90. So for this 90 of course the company has to deposit another 10 to remain at 100. So that's what I mean by the impress system to determine how much cash is, how, how much cash should be on hand for the company. So those will be recorded into the petty cash book 
such as this. And what it completely does is to record it onto a petty catch book. And what the auditor does is to try to see where not the catch balance says is actually correct. So what the auditor does first, like they can count the catch balances at the year end and agree to the petty catch book. What they like to do is that they're going to agree to the petty catch book and try to say whether or not the catch balance is actually to 100. Of course, if they're using the impress system, surely that balance should be 100. And the auditor can inspect any of these unbanked checks. So. The, the, the company can receive the check from a customer but hasn't gone to the bank to try to get this money. So any of this unbanked check, we're going to inspect it and make sure they've been paid in the company's bank account. We have to make sure that that's not the year event. The company receiving any of this uh, receipt from the customer but hasn't gone to the bank to get this money. You have to get this money from the bank. Are we going to agree this? to a bank reconciliation as well. Okay, so that's how we perform the cash audit. Okay, so that's the section on how we provide the substantive testing onto the bank and cash. So make sure that when you're talking about bank, you got the CCSR. When you talk about cash, you need to count the cash to make sure it's accurate.